Good afternoon. Welcome back. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your break. We are glad to see you all again. Uh, to those who are just joining us, welcome to Stanford Law School. My name is Robert Garcia. I'm the Senior Symposium Editor of Volume 64 of the Stanford Law Review. Uh, again, welcome. We are very excited uh, to see all of you here today. Um, we're continuing on with our next panel, which is First Amendment Tort and privacy. But before we dive into that, I just want to remind people who just arrived the MCLE forms, uh, please turn in your evaluation to the registration table. And if it's closed down, you can just leave them up here or on a desk somewhere and we will find them. Uh, bathrooms, ladies behind me, men on the first floor. And for those accessing our Wi-Fi network, the network name is Stanford. Uh, the username is privacy and the password is law school, all in lowercase letters. Um, Ryan Kahlo, uh, who I mentioned earlier, is here today. Uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to Ryan, uh, who's with the Center for Internet Society, one of our co-sponsors. Uh, he was a tremendous help throughout uh, the planning of this uh, event, so thank you, Ryan, for all of your work. Um, and again, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Sullivan and Cromwell, and Double Boys and Plimpton for their generosity. So moving on to First Amendment, or rather continuing our discuss discussion of First Amendment as we were discussing it on our previous panel. Uh, Simon Frankel is going to moderate this panel. Uh, Simon is a litigation partner in the San Francisco office of Covington and Burling, an international law firm based in Washington, DC. His practice focuses on copyright and trademark litigation, technology and internet privacy disputes, and legal issues related to visual art. His internet privacy litigation work has included defense of numerous class actions brought under the Electronic Communications Privacy Act and the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, as well as uh, state analog. So with that, please join me in welcoming Simon Frankel. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, contrary to what you just heard, I don't believe in um, long introductions, so I will, I will give very short ones to our panelists. Seems a little unfair, but there you go. Uh, and I'll just run down the line. I'll introduce them and then uh, introduce our issues and try to get them started so you can hear from them and not from me. To my immediate left, your right, is Cindy Cohn, the legal director and general counsel at the Electronic Frontier, Frontier Foundation where she is responsible for overseeing EFF's overall legal strategy and supervising ESF, EFF's 10 staff attorneys and legal fellow. To Cindy's left, Tom Goldstein, a partner at Goldstein and Russell DPC, where his practice focuses on Supreme Court litigation. Tom has argued about two dozen cases in the Supreme Court, including the recent Sorrell versus IMF, IMS Health case, which you just heard about a little and which you'll hear more about on this panel. And he also teaches Supreme Court litigation, including here at Stanford Law School. Um, next down, Eugene Volokh teaches free speech law, criminal law, tort law, religious freedom law, and church-state relations at UCLA School of Law, and is the author of several textbooks, including the First Amendment and related statutes. And finally, Jeff Rosen, um, my college and law school classmate, but much more <laughs> distinctive uh, uh, is that he is professor of law at George Washington University School of Law, the legal affairs editor at the New Republic and the author of several books um, and I think recently topically editor, co-editor of Constitution 3.0 Freedom and Technological Change. So freedom, excuse me, First Amendment tort and privacy is a pretty broad topic uh, and implicates a lot of wide-ranging and provocative issues. We will cover only a few of them today but we will try to keep it provocative and interesting. Necessarily implicated in this broad topic are questions of how a person or a corporation's First Amendment rights may implicate and impinge on others' privacy rights, and we'll see that in a couple of recent Supreme Court rulings. So we'll start with a discussion of those two cases and then shift to a Supreme Court decision from a couple of weeks ago that appeared to be a victory for privacy, but may turn out to be more equivocal. And then pause for a moment whether to to consider uh, our notion of privacy in America in a digital age and how it compares to European notions. And then finally, uh, turn to our civil litigation system and in particular our tort law system and ask whether it helps or hurts privacy in different respects. So I'm gonna ask our panelists to start with the Supreme Court's decision last year in Snyder versus Phelps, 
one of its more controversial decisions that year, and one that implicates the First Amendment, tort, and privacy. So maybe, Cindy, you could start us off by saying a little about the case and its significance, and then we could hear from everyone else. Sure, I'm happy to, although um, the EFF didn't participate in the Snyder case um, as a First Amendment junkie. Uh, I've certainly read it and followed it closely. For those of you who don't recognize it by its um, case name, uh, you may recognize it by the God Hates Fags case, um, <laughs> which is uh, one of the signs that was held up by the protesters. That's anti-smoking, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> nice. nice. Um, uh, so the case concerned uh, a very uh, famous or infamous uh, church group, the Westboro Baptist Church in Topeka, Topeka I think, in Kansas, um, that uh, has made a practice of protesting uh, uh, various things, but I think uh, in this particular case, uh, military funerals uh, on the theory that uh, soldiers die because God's punishing the United States for tolerating homosexuality. Um, parse that as you will, but that is, I think, their, their argument. Um, and the case was a tort case, uh, invasion of privacy, um, and a couple other torts uh, that were brought, that was brought by the, the father of a, a soldier uh, who was killed in Iraq um, and whose a funeral uh, ha had one of these protests uh, by the Westboro Baptist Church in it. Um, and the question before the Supreme Court was whether the free speech rights of the um, of the protesters, of the church members, uh, should mean that you could not bring a tort action against uh, uh, that the family of the of the soldier couldn't bring a tort action against them for their their speech activity. And the Supreme Court ruled um, that the speech activity uh, won, and that the 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 protesters did have a right to protest. Um, and that, as, as a result of that, a tort action could not lie against them for their for their activities. Um, I think that there are several things about the case that uh, often get um, it, that seem to be important to the court in this, and I think that are important in thinking about it. And um, um, because I think that the particular facts of this case are make it a little difficult to generalize more broadly. Um, although I'm not a law professor, and so they'll do that better than me. Um, but the, the first thing that seemed to be pretty compelling uh, to, the, to the court was that the distance from the, from the funeral to the protest activity was about 1,000 yards, so, so th over three football fields away. Um, and that the father of, of the soldier, while he uh, reported great emotional distress, um, and I don't think anybody disputed that, um, didn't actually see the protest. He, he heard about it later on, uh, on TV, and, and that's how he knew it had happened. He'd seen kind of the tops of the signs, and, but he didn't really know what was going on. So his emotional distress didn't happen at the, at the time, I think the very sensitive time there. And I, I tend to think that those two factors had a lot to do kind of as a, not as a doctrinal level, but as a kind of emotional level about where the court came out on this on this case. Um, the other thing that the court said a couple of times, which um, I don't know what to make of, and I'm interested in what uh, the, the professors on the panel think of, is that the, the, at the time, this all happened in Maryland. Maryland didn't have a statute. There was no statutory prohibition um, that attempted to deal with the problems of protests at funerals. Um, and that, that by the time the case was decided, Maryland did have such a statute. Um, although the statute put a boundary around how close to a funeral you could be to protest, that still would have made this protest legal because it was outside the boundary. Um, and I thought that the mentioning repeatedly of the statutory, uh, the, the fact that there was no statute and then there was one later um, in the decision was interesting. And I, I actually was curious about what some of the people who look, look at the Supreme Court, I mean, I've got three people on this panel who follow the Supreme Court much more closely than I do on these things, thought about that kind of repeated invocation of the fact that the, the, that the legislature hadn't tried to deal with this at all. Um, in the context of a First Amendment analysis. Tom? Sure. Uh, first, uh, like everybody else, I'm very grateful for the invitation and for you all to take the time to be here. I'll take up the uh, opportunity to talk about the relationship between the tort suit and the state <coughs> statute then. Uh, I think that when the court granted cert, there was a little bit of a puzzle here. Uh, the church had one below in the Fourth Circuit and folks went, wow, there's no real circuit conflict here, which is usually the reason that the Supreme Court steps in to take a case. They must be seriously thinking about 
a, enacting a or accepting a kind of funeral exception to the general principle that speech, no matter how abhorrent its subject, is constitutionally protected. And what came to pass is that the Supreme Court, I think, actually granted review in order to um, uh, have, understanding that the church would win, but in a way that was less expansive doctrinally. And the reason was that the Fourth Circuit's decision in this case seemed to nuke all the state statutes that were being enacted and federal legislation that was being considered. The Court of Appeals seemed to be of the view that this was such important speech, uh, albeit important in this particular instance, that really any attempt to restrict it, whether, whether by legislation or by a tort suit, would be unconstitutional. And what the Supreme Court did is take the case and write an opinion that through all the references to state law and by writing it in a way that described the fact that they were further away, they were operating legally, makes very clear, I think, that you can enact time, place, and manner restrictions that kind of ha allow these folks to speak at some distance that will protect a legislature could determine the integrity of the funeral and not cause the emotional harm that might occur if it was right there literally in the face of the folks attending the funeral and the families and the like. The only other thing I would mention about the case is I do think that the Supreme Court loves to be able to say things like, oh, the horror of this speech, but it's the cost of a free society. I mean, I just think it's like, oh. <laughs> uh, and so, I, you know, this is a, they, uh, cases like this one are, I think, tremendous for them because it really gets to show how protective they are of, of liberties, even in the, the most difficult circumstances. Uh, so um, I, I uh, uh, think that the Snyder decision is clearly correct. Uh, uh, obviously, not everybody agrees. Justice Alito didn't. But <coughs> excuse me, if you didn't hear about the particular terms of the speech and just said and just heard, oh, there is a proposal to, to impose multi-million dollar liability of speech on the standard that it's outrageous, because that's the legal standard. It's outrageous and recklessly inflicts severe emotional distress. Take it if, if you never heard anything about the case, but just sort of remember the First Amendment doctrine, it's vague, it's likely overbroad, it's open invitation for viewpoint discrimination, obviously what's outrageous and what's not. To many people, just human nature being what it is, it's easier to see outrageousness in admittedly extreme things on the other side from where you are than on equally extreme things on your side. So I think the court was clearly right. I do think there's the question as to whether uh, content neutral or, uh, ordinances are going to be constitutionally permissible. I will say it is a complicated question. Uh, let's say that somebody's picketing outside your place of business. You say, I'm a captive audience today. I have to go twice a day, every day, maybe more often than I have errands to run. Go past people calling me scab and traitor and whatever else. The answer is too bad. That's speech. What about if you are going to an abortion clinic? as an employee or as somebody to get an abortion. There have been restrictions on that, but basically the uh, setting aside situations where there have been persistent problems with blocking of entrances, the restriction is basically, well, they have to stay eight feet away from you. They can be right across the street, they can call the doctors baby killers, they can do whatever they want. On the other hand, with regard to the home, the court said in Frisbee v. Schultz that ban on picketing right in front of the home is constitutional. Uh, although in Madsen, an abortion, uh, mostly an abortion clinic case, the court said that a ban on picketing within 300 feet of an abortion uh, a clinic employee's uh, a home is not constitutional. So it seems it's willing to tolerate some bubble zones around, uh, uh, around uh, uh, people's homes, but of less than 300 feet. Whether it'll assimilate the funeral home to, uh, or, or, or the cemetery to the home, and what what exactly number it'll it'll ultimately endorse, or that it'll assimilate it more to the place of work or an abortion clinic. That's the uncertain question. Jeff, I'm interested in Justice Alito's dissent. Uh, it was striking, uh, first of all, that he was the only justice to disagree. He was concerned about privacy in public spaces. He said uh, the mere fact that the funeral took place in public didn't mean that the family uh, wasn't immune from insult. And that sort of signaled 
uh, and look forward to his uh, opinion in the Jones case, which we'll talk about in a moment, where he heroically recognized the importance of privacy in public and rejected the Obama administration's extreme and unnecessary position that we have no expectations of privacy in public. But there was also an interesting debate between Alito and the majority about whether or not the speech was on a matter of public concern. And the majority said, absolutely, it's of central public concern that this group thinks that the Catholic Church and the military wrong, wrongly tolerate uh, homosexuality. Alito said, no, this was an attack on uh, this soldier's uh, status as a private person. It was his own Catholic religion and his own status as a soldier that was being targeted. And therefore, the speech was not on a matter of public concern. Broadly, the opinion suggests that when the First Amendment is pitted against privacy, a lopsided majority is willing to hold for the First Amendment. And it's striking there have been a series of other privacy and dignity related cases where Alito has been the only dissenter from this uh, proposition. He was the only dissenter in the Crush video case. Remember those terrible animal uh, fetish videos that Congress banned? Uh, the Supreme Court, eight to one, struck down the ban, and Alito said the speech was of no redeeming social value, and the dignitary interest in protecting the animals should trump. In the violent video games case, he was one of, I guess, three justices who was willing to say that certain categories of speech uh, posed grave indignities and was of no compelling uh, social value. And unlike Justice Scalia, he was willing to recognize the possibility of a right of informational privacy in the NSA and Nelson case. So Alito is clearly more attuned to recognizing these dignitary interests than anyone else. The last thing I'd say is that although the, it's, it's a good thing, I agree with Eugene, as he signaled all this in his uh, in his article uh, uh, almost a decade ago, it's a good thing that free speech is winning over privacy when it comes to government uh, suppression of speech. This is not where all the action is. The real thing that is affecting citizens uh, uh, is being fired or not hired on the basis of embarrassing Facebook pictures and chat and so forth. And here we're seeing judges come to the opposite uh, conclusion. When the young teacher in training posed for uh, a picture of herself on MySpace with a pirate's hat drinking from a plastic cup and the caption, drunken pirate. And she was fired because of this because she was supposed to be promoting underage drinking. She challenged this as wrongful discharge and said her speech was protected by the First Amendment. And a judge rejected the claim saying the speech was not on a matter of public concern and therefore wasn't protected. So I think in an age when the internet service providers like Google and Facebook have far more power over speech than the government does, uh, the fact that the US Supreme Court is willing to bend over backward to find speech on matters of public concern in the tort cases may not provide much protection for citizens where it actually matters. Although we are seeing, and there was a district court decision here recently that, that suggested that matters could be of public concern to, for example, your friends on Facebook. And you could be a celebrity to your friends on Facebook. So. Uh, th th there may be little niches where these doctrines play out in, in sort of microclimates. And did that allow people to remove pictures, or what was the context? Well, it was in a different context of a right of publicity claim against Facebook based on their uh, Facebook publicizing their likes. Uh, and uh, uh, so, yeah, it was a case. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no. It was a case where um, basically Facebook started saying, you know your friend Joni likes Twinkies and have a little picture of your friend Joni as it will come up in your feed about and Joni said well wait a minute I, I've got a right not to endorse Twinkies just because even know, though she it, had said she liked them yeah that, and, saying and the, that I like Twinkies yeah. to my friends doesn't mean that so anyway that was yeah. the question so then the question had to do with is this a, a newsworthy information within her social circles such that Facebook could publicize it without right of publicity liability it's interesting, yeah. it seems to work better when there's a commercial interest or a property right involved rather than a dignitary interest, which American courts are very bad at adjudicating. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and in fact the reason this case is proceeding is because there's a the court found basically there was a property right that was violated. But we can come back to that. Uh, I, I wanted to shift to the other significant uh, case, although it, in some ways maybe it's not a privacy case, uh, but it was a First Amendment case from the same 2010 term from the Supreme Court which was the Sorrell versus IMS Health. And, and Tom Goldstein was represented the respondent, uh, victorious respondent there. And I think, Cindy, you put in an amicus brief. We did. Uh, so I, um, uh, it's been cited as evidence of the Supreme Court's very pro-First Amendment um, uh, jurisprudence now. But maybe the story is a little more complicated. And Tom, maybe you could say a little about the case in your view. And then we'll hear from the others. Sure, so let me describe the First Amendment and privacy problem that comes up. When you all get a prescription filled at a pharmacy, 
uh, that pharmacy will, uh, without your knowing it, uh, and I'm on the side of thinking this is a good idea, so uh, I'm not being pejorative about it, but just to be clear and to be fair about it, without your knowing it, we'll de-identify the data uh, as best it can pursuant to HIPAA and various other laws and regulations. So your name will be taken out of it, but it will then take all the prescriptions of all the people in this room and all the other rooms and all the other towns, uh, and in fact, everybody's prescriptions, uh, aggregate them and sell that data. Uh, they will sell it to a data mining company, including companies like IMS Health, which was my client and the respondent in the case. And IMS Health will take that patient de-identified data, but not prescriber de-identified. So uh, that data will reveal all the prescriptions that your doctor or nurse practitioner, or what have you, uh, uh, gives out. Uh, it won't have what the conditions were, but you can infer what the conditions are from what the prescription is. You generally know what the drug is for. Is it just that this doctor prescribed this medication or prescribed it for a, a 30 to 40 year old male living in this zip code? Yes, you can. Uh, well, you would know generally the zip code based on where the pharmacy is, not necessarily where the patient lives, but there's a high correlation between those two. So they'll know a fair amount about the kinds of people for whom it was prescribed. And the data mining company will do various studies, uh, a lot of studies commissioned by drug companies, not surprisingly. But also, they give the information out to medical researchers and the like. The uh, pharmaceutical companies are the ones that are at issue in this case. The pharmaceutical companies will take the data analysis and they will say, here are the prescribers that we want to target for marketing because these are the prescribers that are prescribing competing products or are most likely to switch or treat the condition that our drug is for. And they will develop marketing pitches for particular prescribers on the basis of the data. Uh, and then their, uh, what are known as detailers, their pharmaceutical sales representatives will uh, ask to go see the doctor. The doctor can say no. Uh, but to the extent they can get the doctor's attention, they will pitch their product. So this case has two privacy angles to it. One is the privacy that is involved in the underlying information. So there is the fact that it is uh, the medical practices of various doctors and other prescribers, right? That could be regarded as private conceivably. There is the privacy of the patients so that there are concerns about whether the data is sufficiently de-identified and also um, even though it is patient de-identified, whether there's a sufficient amount of information, for example, the age, if there's ethnicity information and the like, maybe it's a small enough community, there, is the, there are sincere concerns about whether you could figure out who the patients involved were. Uh, that is one set of privacy concerns. The other set of privacy concerns is the marketing and whether it unduly intrudes on the medical practices, which are kind of, you could analogize it to do not call lists, right? There you would recognize you have a privacy in your home. You have the right to say that, that uh, advertisers won't call me in my home if I want to sign off on a do not call list. There are also do not mail lists, things like that, things that have been upheld uniformly by the courts. So three states in the Northeast uh, faced with this problem came up with variations on a theme uh, of a statute. And uh, the understanding of the statute really requires you understanding what their objections were. And like so many statutes, there wasn't one particular objection. So there were people genuinely concerned about both the kinds of privacy that I've described. But I think it's fair to say that the motivating impetus for the legislation was a concern that as drug companies market more effectively, and they're only going to use this for brand name drugs, right, where there are higher profit margins, when brand name drugs are better marketed and are used more by prescribers, that that's going to drive up the cost of health care. Uh, and in the state of Vermont, which is where the Sorrell case came from, the legislature uh, enacted findings which were not written by a First Amendment scholar. Uh, they say things like uh, the marketplace of ideas is causing all kinds of problems. Um, which is actually a wonderful quote lifted from Supreme Court cases saying things like the government may not intervene in the marketplace of ideas. Uh, they but, just sort of got it wrong. Yes, they got it backwards in a sense. Uh, and uh, that proved problematic uh, in the Supreme Court. So, but they enacted a statute that said, um, you, uh, we're not trying to eliminate all the use of, well, this is called prescription history information. Uh, you can use it for a variety of purposes. You may not use it for marketing. 
Uh, and so the case, uh, the First Circuit had upheld these statutes, the Second Circuit had invalidated them, and as the case came to the Supreme Court, it was really a question of how to characterize the statute as was this a sincere effort to protect privacy, like HIPAA? And many people were very genuinely concerned that our position was an attack on <coughs> critical privacy statutes like HIPAA. Because you can imagine a theory for our case, which is, look, this information is in the hand of the pharmacy companies. It's their property. They have the right to use it. You can't stop them from speaking on the basis of it. And if you have that strong a view of the First Amendment and its relationship to information, then things like HIPAA, which regulate information in private hands, your doctor having your private medical information, could be called into question. On the other hand, if you conceive of the case as involving an attempt to discriminate against a particular form of speech, that is what we were able, I think, to persuade the Supreme Court was is uh, of the following. that the state of Vermont didn't want brand name drug companies engaging in more effective marketing to doctors. But they loved generic drug companies using prescription history information to go to doctors to encourage doctors to use generic drugs instead. And the state itself had set up a program, and had, as had other states, for counter detailing where prescription history information would be used to go to pitch to doctors to use generic drugs. And so we framed the case as uh, one about discrimination and not about privacy and said, look, if the state of Vermont was serious about this is a privacy interest, it would ban all use of the information. It wouldn't allow generic drug companies. It wouldn't allow the state. It wouldn't allow medical researchers to use the same information. You can't pick out one speaker and limit its access to information that it's going to use for speech because you're just discriminating because you don't like their message. Uh, and the Supreme Court uh, agreed with us in an opinion by Justice Kennedy that is quite expansive, uh, that says things <laughs> like uh, commercial speech is really the most important kind of speech. No, it doesn't really say that. <laughs> it has a, it only it has a wonderful flair to it that um, you, had, you had the sense that Justice Kennedy has you know, long thought about these questions, is very much cares about the First Amendment. It was the end of the term. The case was argued in April. There were a bunch of things he'd been meaning to say for a while. And uh, while he was at it, uh, he might add in a few other thoughts uh, and overrule a case or two and no worries. Uh, but it's a very interesting, resounding uh, reaffirmation of the notion in particular that you won't discriminate against speakers. And it has a very favorable citation to HIPAA that says, if you want to protect privacy, do it in a tailored way and show that you're serious about it uh, and we'll talk again. Uh, and I would be shocked, uh, absolutely shocked, if uh, Sorrell ever came to stand for a proposition like a statute like HIPAA was unconstitutional. Um, I, I tend to agree with Tommy about the uh, the implications of Sorrell, and I, I, you know, we were very, we were among the many organizations that were very concerned that Sorrell was gonna was gonna um, end up being a. a uh, an overturning of a lot of privacy statutes because um, and we had faced a, a, a similar sort of argument actually in the warrantless wiretapping cases um, it, my organization sued on behalf of AT&T customers uh, uh, for the NSA's warrantless wiretapping program but one of the interesting things uh, that that happened in that case is some other lawyers sued Verizon um, we didn't have evidence against Verizon. Um, not that they didn't do it, but I had evidence against AT and T, um, and and I don't know, but uh, I have strong suspicions. And but in any event, Verizon, in responding to this, made this argument. They said the information about who our customers call, call data records, um, and uh, it, it's it's ours. It's our records, and we have a First Amendment right to hand it over to the government whenever we please, um, and. Um, so when we saw the Sorrell case, we were quite concerned that that was actually going to be the question presented and decided by the Supreme Court, um, which would be very troubling. Um, it ended up not being briefed that way or uh, that way. Um, we, we ended up filing a brief that really talked about the need to protect HIPAA and some of the other state privacy protective laws. Um, and also to make the point about re-identification, those of you who here were on the last panel, uh, there was a really great discussion about how uh, about the the how easy it is to re-identify people from so-called anonymous data, and in medical situations, of course, it's very compelling because you could be the only person in your zip code with a particular medical condition. It's not that hard. Um, it, it's not that hard to do re-identification in in these particular 
um, circumstances. So what, what we filed was a brief that actually had just a lot of descriptive information in it for the court about how this, this idea that it was anonymized information is something that they need to look at very, they can't just take that at face value because it's not really true if your interest is in protecting the patients. Um, it, it ended up that the, the, the case turned on the interest in protecting the, the, prescription, the, the prescription writing of the doctors much more than the patients. I don't think that the Supreme Court gave much weight to the patients' issues here. I think they felt like it wasn't really presented all that clearly, so it ended up being about the doctor's prescription and then also about the anti-discrimination argument. So, you know, I, it was a it was a nervous making case for us, but I think it did come out in a way in which uh, the, the, it certainly seems to protect the kind of fundamentals of most of the privacy laws and didn't go into this. You know, uh, the data that we collect about people becomes the property of the company, and then the company's First Amendment interest is the only one you have to think about at that point, which I think is a very disturbing argument. Yeah, let me ask Tom. Maybe you could say a bit more on this issue. You talked about the question of discrimination between the branded and generics. What if you had a broader law in Vermont that simply said that pharmacies cannot disclose this information, even if it's anonymized? Uh, uh, I, then could that be? Up, I mean, that seems to have a lot of implications for most of the large um, social media sites. Yeah, I think that that there is a discussion in Sorrell of a case. Uh, let me add, I mean, there, there, there's obviously the First Amendment rights, but we have limits on what information you can get hold of yes. to exercise your First Amendment rights all the time. Right. And why isn't that a limit that would be upheld? So I, I think there's a it's, a, it's a very difficult question that would be much closer in the Supreme Court than Sorrell ended up being. I had argued a case uh, called LAPD versus United Reporting Company that it seemed like it was a, about a California statute that said um, oh, we had defended it. It had said, if you are arrested, we will uh, not release your information to businesses. We'll give it to the press, uh, but we're trying to protect your privacy. Uh, uh, and um, we just won't give it to lawyers who might want to advertise that they would be your lawyer and things like that because we want to protect your privacy. But the LA Times, that's cool with us. Um, and we had, that was upheld uh, on a, a procedural ground. And uh, Justice Kennedy had dissented in that case. And the issue in that case was that the, it was a governmental record, was our defense of it. And the government can do whatever it wants. And Justice Kennedy in the Sorrell case says, no, 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 no. Uh, whether it's a governmental record or the fact that it's you know, a record that you get because of a governmental program, we are not saying that you can restrict it however you want consistent with the First Amendment. So Sorrell's discussion of the LAPD case suggests that that is a, a very, very difficult question. The state of Vermont had said pharmacies have prescription history records only because we make people fill out prescriptions to make sure that the right people are getting the right drug. So this is effectively a governmental record in a private hand. Uh, and the United States government supported that view. And I would say that that's, that case is going to be 5-4 one way or the other. Um, but that in the end, I think it, that kind of statute will be upheld so long as it's reasonably tailored in the way HIPAA is. I just The court cares in many visceral ways, Justice Alito is an example, uh, Sonia Sotomayor is an example, about kind of personal privacy in the most basic medical situations. I cannot imagine that they would uphold, have, you know, that they would strike down a law that says the kinds of drugs I am prescribed uh, is going to stay private. Yeah. Uh, Eugene and Jeff, do you want to jump in? So I wanted to uh, say a couple of things about more, more of this conversation than, Sor than about Sorrel. Um, so first, I just Different people have different views about this, but I think it's a mistake the, uh, to <coughs> articulate some some of these questions as some people do as to whether it's the business owner uh, that owns the data or the consumer that owns the data. And I think that's a false dichotomy. There's a third option, which is the data is not owned in the sense of being exclusively limited to some particular people. If you have a conversation with me, it's not like I own the conversation, I can stop you from talking about it, or you own the conversation, you can stop me from talking about it, unless you're consulting me say, as, a, as a client to a lawyer. It's that it's facts and ideas in the copyright term are free as the air to the common use. They're not owned by anybody. So the real question is not whether, whether people who have certain information about others now own that information, it's whether there is no property right constraint on anybody talking about that. Maybe there should be a constraint, maybe there shouldn't be, but articulating as the question, 
who owns this, I think, misses the possibility that it's not owned and therefore can be talked about by anybody. Second, I just the, some of the discussion about the uh, the telephone companies' arguments about uh, uh, their rights to report things to the first to the government, which in fact maybe they're mistaken on this, but reminded me of this new statute that was enacted just a couple of uh, months ago in California. It's called the California Reader Privacy Act. Oh, Eugene. Okay. You no, know, that that sounds like a great statute, <laughs> California Reader Privacy Act. And what it does is it deals with book services. And it bars book services from revealing information about their customers to the government. And I looked at it, and maybe I'm wrong, but basically this means, uh, the, just reading the statute, if a bookstore observes a crime taking place by one customer against another, one customer punches another or something like that, with, with, there are some exceptions to this, but in many situations, it would be a crime for it to call the police and say, I saw who committed this crime. Or if a bookstore owner overhears a conversation... But is that so if they were reading a book at the time they struck them? No, no, they don't have to be reading. They just have to be in the bookstore as a customer or prospective customer. Um, uh, likewise, if a bookstore overhears a conversation between two people, which is incriminating, in many situations it's not allowed to pick up the phone and call the police. I think that is a First Amendment violation. I think it's a violation of free speech rights, maybe you could say petition clause rights, but I think these things need to be taken seriously. Now I tend to agree with Tom about, uh, uh, about HIPAA and about other things. I do think that, for example, saying to a lawyer, when you overhear, a, or when you hear a conversation uh, of, of your client with, let's say, uh, a, a, a colleague of yours, in which he's talking about a crime he had committed, then you can't call the police. That is a narrow and well-established limitation on lawyers' free speech rights. I think the same thing may be true with regard to doctors and in some situations with regard to pharmacies and confidential communications by their, client, by their clients. I just don't like the sort of privacy creep where those, I think, very sensible, long-standing, traditional, professor, prof professional client, excuse me, um, uh, uh, restrictions are now being broadened to the point where a bookstore owner owes the same duty of confidentiality with regard to the crimes. Not in all instances. There are a few exceptions, but there are large areas which are not accepted, crimes committed by its owner. That is now the law in California. I think it's a bad, probably not intentional on the part of the legislature, but maybe it was. I don't know. All I know is that that's a, an example of where privacy, supposed privacy rights running amok, interfering with those free speech rights and with law enforcement. Well, we've had three fairly sunny uh, 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 reviews of Sorrell, and with all congratulations to Tom for his typically superb victory, <coughs> I'm a little less uh, optimistic. Uh, Justice Breyer wrote a quite uh, uh, alarmist uh, dissent in which he suggested that the majority's reasoning would call into question many of the regulations of the post-New Deal regulatory state and, resignate and, and resurrect Lochnerism with a vengeance. Breyer said, never before has the Supreme Court subject commercial speech to heightened scrutiny merely because it's speaker-based and content-based. And then he noted that almost all uh, regulations uh, are both content-based and Speaker based. He notes that the FDA oversees the form and content of advertising sales proposals for drugs but not furniture. That's uh, content based. And as for speaker based, he says that an energy regulator might require the manufacturer of home appliances to publicize ways to reduce energy consumption but not industrial equipment. It's um, also unrealistic to expect use limitations to be completely general in an age when, as we heard on the previous panel, American law doesn't typically authorize uh, uh, re medical research, for example, uh, with a single statute. Uh, medical research is permissible for HIPAA purposes, but we learn not for other purposes. That's why Vermont, in this case, needed to say that you can't use the data for uh, advertising, but you can use it for research. But that authorization of research proved to be uh, fatal to its constitutional case under heightened scrutiny. And that's why broadly, uh, um, although Tom is right to say it's a closer case when, 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 the, when the law is less uh, targeted in its exceptions, the mere fact that it's an open question whether a European privacy law that said information shared for some purposes may be disclosed for other purposes but uh, not for uh, impermissible purposes without consent, that's the typical form of the European law, that might be vulnerable under this uh, heightened scrutiny for commercial speech. And obviously Justice Kennedy is indeed, this is near to his heart and he gets uh, next to the sweet mystery of life, uh, not, nothing uh, warms his heart more than the free speech rights of uh, recently of, of corporations, but in an age when that precise question is among the most hotly contested of American politics, 
to uh, let this uh, pass uh, as an insignificant case seems to me wrong. So can I just, um, because the California Reader Privacy Act was sponsored by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and Eugene and I had a, a shortened version of this uh, communication over email, and then I, I was unable to uh, reply to his, his last response, so I apologize. Um, so and next time, I here. definitely will. Um, but <laughs> sure. but um, I guess you know. So let, let me uh, to explain a little bit about the, the reader privacy. But in the you know in, in in the state of California, if you check books out of a public library, um, there is a, a, a requirement that the public library require a, a, a warrant before it turns over your reading records to uh, law enforcement. They can't just hand it over. They, they need to require a warrant. Um, now uh, we have uh, uh, many of our public libraries are being digitized by private companies. Uh, Google, for instance, is doing a lot of this, but um, and, and and but yet the, the the legal protections that exist in most states, some of them are laws and some of them are attorney general's opinions, to protect your reader uh, privacy records, um, don't extend to private libraries. They they were, they're public libraries because at the time that they were passed, there really wasn't anything like that. So the ACLU and the EFF um, joined together to ask the California legislature to pass a law that basically requires a warrant before your reading history can be turned over uh, to governmental officials. Um, it, it, it's, not, it's not a warrant. It's a court order of a specific kind. Um, there's reasons why it's not a warrant. but let, let's, So it's a court order. Uh, we had to amend that. I'm sorry about that. Um, a court order of a specific kind, but with very high standards. Um, and, um, and, and of course, your reading history, your reading records in the context of digital libraries especially are much, much more broadly than just what you check out, right? Because Google, for instance, in the Google Books pro uh, <coughs> product knows what you browse, they know what you look at, they know what you pull off the shelf, they know if you skip to the end, right? I mean, it's, they know everything about what you're doing, far more than just the kind of things the library might know, which is what you checked out at the library or back. So we had to write a broader definition of what what was customer records in the context to, to be able to capture what's going on in digital stuff. We did make it apply to regular bookstores too, brick and mortar as well as digital because it seemed unfair to us to have a situation in which there was a higher standard for um, Google to turn over your information to law enforcement than there was for Kepler's uh, to hand over your information. So we included everybody and we tried to make it one one rule for everything. And um, it also has an, an emergency exemption in it. So. Um, you can certainly call the cops if there's a crime in progress against the bookstore. Um, and, and, and so, um, but what Eugene is concerned is that this tremendous epidemic of people in bookstores punching each other <laughs> and kicking each other. It happened to me just last week. And the, the, the horrible you know, epidemic of situations in which the, 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 the bookstore owner can't call the cops and say, you know, of course, the bookstore owner can always call the cops. I mean, there's no reason. That, there's nothing about the, that even touched by that. But, it, but the bookstore owner, under an, a, a very broad reading of our statute, couldn't say it was the, that guy there in the red jacket who punched Cindy. Um, or maybe it was me doing the punching. We could do this either way. But, um, and I just, um, I, I, as I say, I, 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 I'm loath to explain to Eugene why my law is narrower. Then I, you know, we already narrowed it a lot, um, <laughs> but I don't think it actually is going to ever present this problem that he's concerned about. Um, but I think it's going to do a lot of good in making sure that the the that the um, that the bookstore owners and that the Googles of the world have to go to when law enforcement shows up, and 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 they do, you know the. The um, you know Amazon just recently had to say, said no to a request for 10,000 reader records uh, in the context of a of a revenue investigation in, in, in I think it was North Carolina. So this is this isn't an abstract concern um, to require judicial oversight and a court order before you turn over people's reading records. I just don't. I, I'm just not. I don't feel like the privacy interests here are trampling over the the, the kind of extreme. Um, circumstances um, that, that Eugene feels so. That's my side of it. I guess I'm, you know, that's so. I'm happy to talk about it a little further, but I, I just I think that's not your best example um, uh, of, of privacy rights trumping uh, peop, uh, trumping people's other rights. Um, and in the context of the wiretapping, uh, one more thing. I'll let other people talk again. Um, when when what Verizon is doing is actually in violation of 
you know, five different laws that prevent them from handing information over to the government without proper process for them to argue that they have a First Amendment right that trumps. They're basically saying all of these statutes are unconstitutional. I think it's a much broader and much more difficult um, argument than, than your bookstore one. But. You know, Cindy, I can't speak to the Verizon uh, issue because I've, I haven't focused closely on it, but I'm just reading the statute here. And you're right, by the way, there's not an epidemic of this, nor there, I believe, is there an epidemic of bookstores, which are deliberately covered. It's not just about Google Books and such. It's breath, uh, uh, um, brick and mortar bookstores as well. I don't think there's an epidemic of bookstores revealing this information improperly. This may not apply to a lot of situations. It does apply to some. It says so right here. A provider sh shall disclose personal information of a user, and that includes the name and the identifying characteristics of a user, which includes anybody who's shopping. It's not just which books he's reading or what page he's on, just the, the name of it, unless all of the following conditions are satisfied, one requires a court order. So if a provider calls up the police and says, I've witnessed this crime by the user, he, or I overheard this user say he's about to commit this crime, or I shouldn't say about to commit, there's an exception for imminent uh, harm, but whether he has committed a crime or he will, will plan to commit a crime, he's violating the law. There is an exception for crimes against the bookstore owner, the provider, or against that user. The exception seems pretty deliberately limited to those things. So if somebody commits a crime against somebody else in the store, or somebody's talking about a crime he has committed or will at some point commit, it is illegal under this law to do this. This isn't a broad reading. This is a reading of ordinary English. Now, maybe this wasn't intended, and maybe the, the law does lots of good things. There are all these provisions in it having to do with what the government may uh, demand, which I have no objection to. But the fact is that the, the, the bookstore does have this pretty striking and literal consequence. And I, I don't think it can be dismissed as just, well, there's no epidemic of that. Well, uh, I don't want to cut you off. No, 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 no that's no, right. No, I, 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 I just want to sure. keep us moving because we have a few more topics I know everyone wants to get through. Uh, we heard a little about um, Justice Alito and Justice Sotomayor's views, and I think uh, that was a reference to United States versus Jones, and I'd like to talk about that. That was a GPS case decided just a couple of weeks ago, and I thought I knew what it held <coughs> until I went online and I read Tom Goldstein's summary uh, of why no one, uh, none of the press accounts of what it held were actually accurate. Uh, maybe, Cindy, you can say a few words about what the case appeared to hold, and then we'll get uh, four diff three other views on what it actually said about whether the government can put a, G a GPS device on uh, someone's car for weeks without a warrant. Is it a search? Is it against the Fourth Amendment? Oh, man, you can make me go for Tommy? Okay. Um, Just briefly. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so the Supreme Court, uh, Tom, Tom was actually right, and I think he did a really good service of getting out there quickly as the story kind of was, was going on. So <coughs> what the Supreme Court held in the Jones case is that the placement of a GPS device on, uh, on, on, a, on a computer, on a computer, listen to me, I'm a tech lawyer, on a car um, is a search for purposes of the Fourth Amendment. But that does not answer the question about whether it's a violation of the Fourth Amendment or not, because the search has to be unreasonable um, in the context of the Fourth Amendment. So I think he did a great job in the, the, the blurring of those two things um, had happened. And, and some of that had to do with the fact that the reasonableness prong wasn't at issue in front of the Supreme Court, so they didn't address it. Otherwise, everybody would have seen that that wasn't the end of the analysis. Um, but, um, but, but he was right. Um, the, the, what the Supreme Court held is, what the Supreme Court did was it, it actually kind of reinstituted a way of thinking about the Fourth Amendment that had kind of gone away a long time ago, which is that the Fourth Amendment question of whether a search happens can turn on a physical, um, uh, the physical uh, 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 trespass, the physical putting of the GPS device on the car was the search for purposes of the Fourth Amendment. Not the gathering of, of personal information about a person. No, it's a, it's a, it's a trespass theory. Um, now, the court was very careful in the majority, and, and I'm going to let, the, I've got three law professors, you're making me do this, but um, the, 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 the court was very careful to say that that did not displace the other theory that we'd all been working on under about the Fourth Amendment for a long time, which is that the Fourth Amendment question of whether the search turns on whether there's a reasonable expectation of privacy in the thing that happened. Um, and, and what uh, the majority opinion said was, well, that's still true. It's just that there's this other way you can get to a search, too. And it reanimated this old idea of thinking about searches as well. So from my perspective, we kind of created, we now have two uh, ways that you get to a search. Um, but that still doesn't tell you whether the Fourth Amendment is violated or not, because you still have to go through the other parts of the analysis. 
Tom, do you want to add? Well, you know, there's so much to be said about Jones, and there are going to be so many post-Jones cases that might come up if Justice Alito's suggestion that the legislature get into this uh, isn't taken up. Um, the thing that really struck me about Jones, for all of the celebration of it being a really pro-privacy decision, right, limits on the government using GPS to track us, was that the court didn't, it, there were a bunch of arguments that the individual made and that the government opposed and that the government won, uh, including that the government can really follow you around with a GPS device, it seems, uh, um, e uh, according to the most privacy, pro-privacy opinion, which I view as the uh, Alito opinion uh, as between him and the majority, uh, if they don't do it for too long, uh, that uh, you know, if they only follow you for a couple of days, uh, then that doesn't defeat a reasonable expectation of privacy. So that's going to be one significant issue in the future. The issue of whether they have to get a warrant at all is a really big issue. Um, and how this decision is going to be applied when you don't have a physical attachment, when you don't have that trespass, but instead you're using cell phone triangulation. What are the restrictions on the government in that context? And the upshot I can tell you from Jones is that if the government can persuade a, a Verizon uh, or somebody else to make available your cell records or some other way uh, or can manage to turn on your car's internal GPS without physically doing anything to your car. Uh, they can track you for a few days without implicating the Fourth Amendment and that's eight to one in the Supreme Court. Uh, and so the government did surprisingly well in this case. I'll mention one other little doctrinal quirk uh, that really interests me a lot for, for reasons that will become obvious in a second, and that is Justice Alito's opinion for four justices says, look, I think that if they're following, uh, tracking the person for several weeks, that allows, that would really offend people's sensibilities. Uh, Justice Sotomayor in another opinion says the reason for that is that the government can learn a lot about you when it aggregates all of this data about where you go, where do you shop, who are your friends, who are you visiting, are you out at night. They can really develop a profile of you and so I think that that's a, uh, something for privacy advocates to celebrate that the five members of the Supreme Court are very concerned about that and they're very concerned about whether there's a device involved or not. They're concerned about the government gathering that information about you. One very weird thing pops up in the Alito opinion. He says, well it depends of course on how serious the, the crime might be. Uh, which is really kind of comes out of nowhere. Uh, and, he said, and he says, you know, well, people's expectations of privacy might be lessened if they knew that the government was investing them, investigating them for something really bad. Uh, and that's really pretty new doctrinally. And then Justice uh, Scalia, in his majority opinion, and Justice Scalia has on occasion been known to kind of take the knife to the enemy. Uh, but, 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 right. but, but only on occasion. On occasion. Uh, really, uh, only when he's writing opinions. The, um, uh, doesn't really go after Justice Alito for this kind of very interesting change in doctrine. And my prediction to you is that the reason they don't talk about this weird development in Fourth Amendment law, that your expectation of privacy depends on how serious your offense is, is because there is another opinion that is circulating in the Supreme Court about this issue that wasn't ready to come out in January. And that's the Florence case on prisons, uh, which is another case that I argued. And it's about strip searches in jails. And we made the pitch in that case that said, if the offense is a minor one, you have a greater expectation of privacy because the governmental interest in uh, searching you is relatively low. They have very little reason to believe you're doing something that's a danger. And I think that Justice Alito has written a very pro-privacy opinion in the Florence case, which will be the actual opinion that really embodies uh, Jeff's sense of Justice Alito. And so I think it's a very weird quirk of timing in the Supreme Court that there's another body of uh, law about the relationship between privacy and um, the Fourth Amendment uh, that we just haven't seen yet and we'll see uh, in a few weeks. Wow. Jeff, do you want to go? Uh, Jones is an occasion for uh, privacy advocates to uh, dance in the streets. It's the most important uh, privacy uh, decision of the decade. We have to pay, I have to pay tribute at this moment to the judge who even more than Justice Alito has done more to defend privacy in uh, the face of technological change than anyone since Justice Brandeis, and that is Judge Alex Kaczynski, who is sitting over there and wrote the greatest opinion in the Ninth Circuit GPS case of any judge on the Federal Circuit. So thank you, Judge Kaczynski, for that. Uh, the reason Alito's Justice Alito's opinion in Jones is uh, 
so exciting is, is precisely the, the, the two reasons that, that Tom signaled made it seem odd. Uh, first, that he insisted on the importance of line drawing. Short-term surveillance might be reasonable and permissible, long-term surveillance is not. That unformalistic but completely intuitive fact is something the court has resisted until now, and it will be crucial for the privacy cases ahead. And as for the distinction between more serious and less serious crimes, which, which Tom is uh, importantly defending in Florence, this uh, isn't a novelty. It goes back to the framing. The, the reason that the framers were concerned about searching the homes of critics of King George uh, and reading their diaries uh, to prove seditious libel was that they thought seditious libel wasn't a serious enough crime to justify the gross intrusions on anonymity and privacy. So I, I think uh, restoring those two elements to the privacy balance, uh, a, a sense of the proportionality, that the intrusiveness of the search, search has to be proportionate to the seriousness of the crime, and, and also that uh, long term is worse than short term, will be very important in the years ahead. The final thing is, of course, once again, it's not the government that's the real threat. The thing is that Google and Facebook, in five years, are going to post live all of the public and private surveillance cameras that are now around the world. And Facebook already is doing this with an app for looking at uh, beach cams in Mexico, which teenage boys love to do. So Facebook, in five years, is going to link the beach cams in Mexico with the metro cams in Washington with the hospital cams in London. And you're going to be able to sign on, as the head of public policy at Google said recently, if they do this, and click on a picture of me, back click to see where I came from this morning, forward click to see where I'm going, and have 24-7 ubiquitous surveillance of everyone online at all times. And when this happens, the question, first of all, is does the Fourth Amendment even apply? It's uh, private cameras. Maybe if the government uses it, it does. But all of a sudden, all of the celebration that we have government restrictions on long-term surveillance are going to be challenged. And the third party doctrine, which does have to be reexamined, won't answer this problem either, which is why Justice Alito's notion that ubiquitous surveillance changes the nature of life in a free society is going to be all the more important. Eugene, let me hold off on you until sure. your time. Uh, Jeff, maybe you can use this as a transition to talk about um, the European notions of privacy and how they would apply to Facebook and Google. Um, we can talk about that for a moment, and then shift to Eugene and talk about tort law. Yes. In the interest of time. So last week, the European uh, commissioner, uh, Vivian Redding, proposed a new right, new privacy right, the right to be forgotten. Uh, and this is, uh, comes originally from the French uh, right, the droit à l'oubli, the right to oblivion. It sounds very French. Uh, <laughs> right out of Sartre. The French want to be forgotten, and Americans want to be remembered. But I'm convinced, after having read the regulations, which were alluded to at the last panel, that this is about to precipitate the most serious battle between European and American notions of privacy and free speech in a generation. The regulation sweeps far more broadly than it was uh, presented, and it is, uh, runs the risk of imposing ruinous liability on Google and Facebook, up to 2% of their $30 billion annual revenues, if they fail not only to remove a picture that I posted myself on Facebook and later want to take down, but also if they fail to remove a picture that I've posted on Facebook and then has been widely shared by my friends and they will approach my friends and ask them to take them down, and if the friends refuse, then Facebook may face liability if it doesn't remove the pictures, or if Google doesn't eliminate all links to the pictures, or even in its most expansive incarnation, if I uh, object to something nasty but true that someone says about me on Google, under the very broad definition of personal data uh, in the regulation, any data that relating to a data subject, even the uh, nasty blog post or status update might be objected to and face possible takedown. So I think the consequences are very sweeping indeed. Now just uh, to emphasize that uh, the right was presented far more narrowly, uh, Vivian Redding in presenting it said the core case was the teenager who puts up a picture and then comes to regret it and wants to take it down. And in this sense, she drew on the strong European notion that people should be able to escape their past. Uh, the uh, French droit à l'oubli was originally uh, invoked to allow people to uh, not have their criminal histories alluded to in newspapers after a certain period of time and to prohibit newspapers from publishing them. In Germany, there's a suit by two convicted murderers uh, of a famous actor against Wikipedia. They want their names removed from his Wikipedia page 
Wikipedia is refusing because under US law, the publication of truthful but embarrassing information is protected. And in cases like uh, Cox and Florida Star, the court has said that uh, lawfully uh, obtained information from court records may not be restricted. But the Europeans have a, have, a, have a history of the opposite tradition. Now the effort is to extend the droit à l'oubli to uh, anyone online. And here the uh, language may be uh, useful. So here's what uh, Vivian Redding said in announcing the new right. She said, uh, if an individual no longer wants his personal data to be processed or stored by a data controller, and there's no legitimate reason for keeping it, the data should be removed from the system. And uh, she downplayed the effect on free speech. She said, it's clear that this right can't be a uh, right to a total erasure of history. Relying on her speeches, several commentators have been reassuring. There was a post at theatlantic.com, why journalists shouldn't fear Europe's new right to be forgotten. John Handel says that original proposals would have allowed people to take down any digital reference that they deemed irrelevant and unflattering. Redding had stressed the new definition is limited to data that people have given out about themselves. And uh, Handel says this is key. It only re refers to data they put online, not the references in the media or elsewhere. But Handel didn't read the regulations that were actually proposed uh, two days later. And they're not limited to personal data that people have given out themselves. They create a new right to delete personal data defined as any information relating to a data subject. Uh, and uh, and that, that creates a presumptive uh, takedown uh, ability. There are three possible categories of the right to be forgotten, as identified by Peter Fleischer, the chief privacy officer at, Googler, at Google, who wrote a, a blog post on this last year. All of them are covered by uh, Redding's categories. The first category, the least controversial, is if I post something online about myself, should I have the right to delete it? I think the better of the uh, drunken Facebook photo. Uh, Facebook and other social networking sites already allow me to do that. Uh, the fact that this creates a legally enforceable right to delete data that people post themselves is mostly symbolic. Although the new regulation would allow people to ensure that Facebook is abiding by its privacy policies and actually deleting the picture, not only from the uh, homepage, but also from the archives. But the right becomes much more controversial when it reaches the second category. If I post something and someone else copies it and reposts it, do I have the right to delete it? Um, here, too, the uh, answer is that the new regulation almost certainly does apply to this category. There's an exemption from the duty to remove data for the processing of personal data solely for, solely for journalistic purposes or for the purposes of artistic or literary expression. But this puts the burden on Facebook to prove to a European Commission authority that my friend's reposting of my embarrassing picture is a legitimate and sole journalistic or literary or artistic exercise. At the very least, Facebook is going to have to engage in the kind of line drawing exercise that used to be limited to judges in evaluating takedown requests. And the prospects of a fine of up to a million euros or 2% of annual income, if you don't take down, could lead to a serious chilling effect. And this chilling effect is not hypothetical. Here's an example of the right to be forgotten in operation. In Argentina, a pop star posed for racy pictures of herself, as pop stars tend to do. She then thought the better of it and sued Google and Yahoo to have these racy pictures removed from the Google and Yahoo search engines. They objected. Google said, we can't comply with such a broad order. And Yahoo said the only way to comply would be to delete all reference to this woman from our search engine. An Argentinian judge, nevertheless, invoking the Argentinian right to be forgotten, fined Google and Yahoo tens of thousands of dollars a day, ordered them to take the picture down. Now, if you plug this pop star's name into the Yahoo search engine, you get a blank page and a court order. So I think that. What's the name? <laughs> uh, <laughs> or have you forgotten? No, here it is. I, I, I've forgotten. Good question. He's forgotten. It's Jessica. It's, it, well, Virginia de Cunha was one of them, but it's the Jessica something or other. It was the swimsuit model. Okay. Jeff, I, Jeff I earlier, earlier you were decrying the fact that people would not get jobs because their uh, drunken photos remained up. Now you're talking about the terrible crushing burden that this would create for Google and Yahoo. Uh, those seem somewhat intentional. No, I, I, they're, they're not. I think there are te technological solutions to this problem, but legal solutions pose this grave threat to free speech. So Facebook 
could make this problem uh, go away to a large degree by uh, empowering disappearing data. It could make it easier when we post something to specify whether we want it to last for a day or a year or a month. And there are apps that already do this. There's a text service called Tiger Text that allows, that creates disappearing text messages. It was named before the Tiger Woods uh, text messaging scandal. But <laughs> technological solutions, I think, make a lot more sense to create a, I think this is the most fascinating conflict between privacy and free speech of our age because it poses so starkly how the internet moves from an open platform to a closed one when you have a legal right to enforce dignitary norms that are hotly contested. It's impossible to know in a case-by-case -case basis what or is not necessary in journalistic or artistic and literary purposes. And that leads to, to the third category and the most troubling, which is that literally anytime someone uh, posts a nasty status update saying that I'm uh, you know, uh, no good, I could object uh, that this is data relating uh, to me and uh, should be presumptively removed and it would have to, it might have to be adjudicated uh, by the European Commission and, and once again the only sensible uh, thing for Facebook and Google to do in this uh, circumstance is, is to block all references to me rather than face the risk of liability. So there's lots of details to be hammered out. This is going to be discussed for the next year by the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers. There's a question of whether the safe harbor agreement that's currently in place will uh, remain or if the EU withdraws, uh, Google and Yahoo will indeed be liable uh, throughout uh, uh, Europe. But I find it, although Europe has a tradition of defining dignitary rights broadly and enforcing them much more narrowly, this regulation will be promulgated. It doesn't have to be um, implemented by each national legislature. It's self-executing once it's put into place. And a year from now, once the right to for, uh, be forgotten is up and running, I can't imagine that the internet will be as free and open a place as it is today. Okay, before we shift to Eugene and his thoughts on tort law and privacy, any comments on Jeff from Tom, Cindy? Just super quickly, I mean, I happen to think our system for balancing expression versus privacy is better than other countries, but I don't think that you can normatively say that Argentina's got it wrong or the French are crazy, maybe. The, but, you know, just in general. For other reasons. Right, for other reasons. And so I think that this is really a question of, uh, since there's no real norm here that says objectively we've got it right, they've got it wrong, this is a transnational problem, one that comes up a lot in the internet and it's going to have to be resolved through some sort of treaty regime unless, I just don't know how to make the Argentinians stop. Like on what basis I can say, you know, you can't do this. Uh, and so it, it generates a, uh, a different kind of puzzle for me than making the choice between privacy versus publicity um, uh, and speech, uh, and rather one of how we're going to regulate it, the internet crossing boundaries. Yeah, and this, I mean, this question of, um, really it kind of comes down from the perspective of the companies, I think, question to what, what jurisdictions do you want to have assets in, right? What laws do you want to be subjected to? Because you know, a company can um, you know can can be strategic about where where they go and where they don't go. Twitter, for instance, has made a very well. They got a lot of trouble last week for something, but in any event, they they've been really clear that they're not going to put any assets in China and that they don't want to ever be in a position where they are beholden to a lawful you know as lawful as possible, but a court order in in China around freedom of expression. And so I think that it, you know, it really does take some sophisticated thinking about where, from the company's perspective, about where, you know, where, where are intermediaries receiving protection for hosting other people's speech. And um, you know, right now we tend to have a race to the bottom around that, but I think we need to, the companies need to try to turn that into a race to the top. We see it in the copyright wars, we see it in the privacy issues, we see it all across the board, and the, you know, the, the, the time when, you know, we're now in a time when people are understanding that there are a lot of intermediaries that are involved in the space between you and your audience online. Um, there's your platform, there's the platform if you're Facebook closed platform or the open app, uh, an open platform like your ISP or blogger hosting a blog. There's the DNS hosts, there's the, there's the you know, payment processor sometimes. Um, EFF has a, we just put together, tried to put together a little visualization about um, what we call the weakest link problem. Um, that, 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 that in between you and your audience, there's a whole lot of people in the digital world and you can begin to put pressure on those people to try to stop the speech, 
right? Because the the you know so I think that um, you know from the perspective of going after intermediaries, it w really will have a huge effect on freedom of speech if we let, in the name of privacy or copyright or anything else, move the debate and the discussion from the individuals involved to the platforms that host the speech because they just won't do it. You, you know, you're just not going to do it. And so um, I think it's a really important question. I mean, that doesn't get all the way to the right to be forgotten. Some of the right to be forgotten stuff about having your own right to take down stuff from, from your own thing, I think is, again, frankly, pretty uncontroversial. And then there's some harder questions in the middle there. Um, but I think from the perspective of beginning to think about protecting intermediaries as a way that we protect speech, um, and in some ways can also protect privacy, but um, but centrally there, that, that's going to be the central animating issue. Um, and it's a global issue and it's a domestic issue. Um, Eugene's going to talk a little now about um, tort law and privacy. Historically, tort law is seen as a mechanism for protecting privacy and defining privacy rights. Um, but Hillary may challenge that notion. Eugene, you may want to leave a little time for questions. Yes, absolutely. As you can. So uh, the name of this the talk is Tort Law Versus Privacy. And the basic question is, how does tort law undermine privacy in the sense of pressuring people to do things that would be seen as restrictions of privacy? I don't want to say invasions, because that suggests that's wrong. It suggests that the restrictions are improper. But restrictions on privacy, and what, if anything, should be done about it. Now, why is there an issue? Negligence law. Forget about the fancy privacy doors, narrow as they are. Let's talk about the big one, negligence law. It requires reasonable care to avoid harm. Those of us familiar with the learned hand formula know that is cost-effective precautions. You don't have to take reasonable, extraordinary care to avoid all harm, but you often have to take cost-effective precautions. What it may do is it may mandate surveillance may mandate as a precaution that if you are in a position where you have to take precautions against crime, you may need to surveil, you may need to investigate, you may need to disclose, and you may need to report to the government information about individuals. I'll get to the details in a moment. And the tendency increases as technology makes these activities cheaper. So that's one of the important points. It's cost-effective precautions that are required to the extent that today this may in fact require business owners to put up comprehensive surveillance as a means of protecting their, uh, their clients, you know, the, uh, 30 years ago they would say, oh, come on, that's obviously cost prohibitive. The privacy issues wouldn't even have arisen. Now it's not cost prohibitive. 30 years from now it will be even less, co uh, even less costly. Um, uh, so as a result, you have more and more situations where the, the demand is do all of those things. And in those cases, almost never do the courts even really talk about the privacy implications, at least in any serious sense. Uh, what's more, while this in a sense has to do only with private surveillance, which I know many in the audience are concerned about, but many more are concerned about government surveillance, it actually has an impact on government surveillance. One is that sometimes the defendant uh, that is pushed into the surveillance by tort law is itself a government entity. Government, as we'll see, property owners have particular obligations here. Some of those property owners are government, government uh, 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 buildings, government landlords, uh, public housing, universities, uh, um, uh, uh, and housing on, uh, on their property. What's more, where private entities gather, the government may subpoena. If a private shopping mall has all of this uh, surveillance data stored in its computers, then the government can turn around and subpoena, of course, without any showing of a probable cause, uh, 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 given, the, given the court's uh, uh, Fourth Amendment case law, may subpoena, and then it's not in the government's hands. What's more, if private entities are required to surveil in certain ways, it just becomes a lot harder to argue the government is barred from surveilling in the, in the, uh, in the same way. If indeed there emerges a norm, as I think there's some pressure towards this now, that private entities have to put up cameras everywhere uh, in order to protect their, their uh, uh, clients against crime, uh, it becomes a lot harder to argue against uh, government uh, 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 just deciding in its own or, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to implement similar surveillance. And finally, I think it affects reasonable expectations of privacy. Uh, that to the extent that reasonable expectations of privacy are relevant to Fourth Amendment law, and we know they're very relevant, they're molded by social practices. They're molded in considerable measure by private practices as well as government practices. So on to the details. First of all, let me tell you, the underlying legal duties, remember negligence involves breach of a duty. I'm not claiming that all of you have duties to surveil in order to prevent harm to me. That's generally not so, but you do have pretty broad duties. First, you have duties to reasonably try to avoid causing harm. And that means avoid being even one of the many causes of harm. 
So, for example, when you're hiring an employee, you have a, uh, with a criminal record, and that employee then attacks me uh, 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 as a result of something, uh, of some powers that he got through his job, you might be liable for negligent hiring on the theory that you helped cause the harm. Of course, you didn't want to harm me. Uh, and of course, the harm was immediately caused by him. But by putting him in this position where he can now attack me, you helped cause the harm. That doesn't mean you're absolutely liable if he's acting outside of the scope of employment. You're not absolutely liable, but you are liable to gather adequate information about him, surveil him, and so on and so forth. They, likewise, if you give an employer a dangerous instrument, employee, which may include, as we'll see in a moment, a computer, you may have a duty to surveil how he uses the computer. Or if you bring a dangerous person onto property, for example, if you, as the landlord, rent to a tenant, who turns out has a criminal record. Or you make a product that people misuse, like a car that can drive very fast. You have a duty to take reasonable care to prevent that car from being, or to, to prevent harms to all these. What's more, you do have also a duty to reasonably, affirmatively protect, not just make sure that what you've done doesn't end up hurting them, but actually take affirmative steps to protect them when they're tenants or visitors to land or third parties uh, uh, who may be attacked by, your, by one of your patients. That's a Tarasov case. So those of you who remember first your torts. Um, what's more, there's no real counter-pressure for privacy guards. I don't, I don't have the time to get into this, but in virtually all of these cases, it's not like, well, negligence law pushes employers or property owners one way, but at least privacy torts push back. For various reasons, the privacy torts offer no real pushback. So let me give you some concrete examples. First, let's talk about four that came up in one case, but uh, there are other cases like that too, just this one case that, the one case that really does seriously discuss this, sorry. Sorry, the, the clicker is a little slow here. So let's just begin with the first set of three. Um, this Doe v. Johnson, Johnson's Magic Johnson, sleeps with Doe, she gets HIV from her. Now she sues, saying you were negligent in transmitting HIV to me. Uh, and and for, for various reasons, what that means is you were negligent in not warning me that you had HIV. But Johnson says, look, I didn't know I had HIV. She says, well, you were negligent in not, negligent in not warning me that there was somebody whom you had sex with in the past, who you know now, who you knew at the time, not the time you had sex with that person, but the time you had sex with me, had HIV. And if there was no such person, because remember, this is all pre-trial, so, we, so uh, this, these are things that she's hoping to learn to discover, you were negligent in not warning me about your high-risk sexual behavior. Could be that you engaged in, uh, in male homosexual sex. It could be that you just had lots and lots of sexual partners. You had a duty to warn me of all these things. This is one of the few of these cases where the court actually talks about privacy. And I think it does a pretty credible job, though interesting. Here are the results. He has a duty to disclose STDs. The notion of duty to disclose communicable disease is actually quite old, common law duty, going back 100 years. He has a duty to disclose that a past sexual, sexual partner had an STD. He doesn't have a duty to disclose high-risk behavior in his partner. It's an interesting question. All of this is probabilistic, mind you. Even if he had HIV, the chances of him passing through a particular sexual incident are quite low. So it's all a matter of probability. Um, but turns out that about one in 300, when I last checked, one in 300 women in the US are infected with HIV. Uh, so if he knew that one past sexual partner had HIV, the probability that he had HIV is probably about the same, not exactly the same, but about the same as if he'd had several hundred sexual partners. He didn't know any, of anything about any one of them in particular, but in the aggregate, you think chances are at least one of them had HIV at that point. So the court draws this line. It might be the right line. And the court at least talks about the privacy implications, unlike in many of these other situations. Well, why does that line make sense? The court doesn't. We don't really know. So at least that's an interesting conundrum, but at least one in which the court talked about the, uh, about the uh, privacy questions, and incidentally, it's the one that, uh, uh, that has the least of a kind of a new technology dimension. Now let's move on. Cargill versus Sandpack of Partnership. Complicated and weird in many ways case, but it turns out Carol Scott is a tenant in a building, and she takes up with somebody who has a sex crime record. This is before Megan's laws. So this guy moves into the, into the house, into the apartment building, into Linda Scott's apartment, and then he rapes Lin, uh, Carol Carp, who's the plaintiff. She sues, in particular, this is the opinion that was published, she sues Linda Scott 
for first letting somebody into this apartment building who was a sex, sex offender, and second, not warning everybody of, that, there is, that there's a sex offender in the, in the building. And the court says, yes, that's a case that can go forward. Naturally, there's no final verdict that I could find. I assume that it's settled, like most of these cases settle after when uh, the case is not dismissed. But note, if Linda Scott had this duty to Carol Harbour to make sure she doesn't do things, let in, the, um, let in the, this, this dangerous guy into the apartment building without taking proper precautions, warning Carol Cargo, then it's even clear that the landlord has the same duty. So what this means is landlords have a duty to uh, report to all their tenants about, about criminals who, whom they allow to live in the, uh, in the building. Now, to be sure, uh, some of this may be mooted because these days you already have to do that in many respects. Not exactly that, but something similar has to be done with regard to sex offenders. But this duty is not limited to, uh, to sex offenders. If it turns out there's somebody who has a conviction for aggravated assault when he was drunk, that could happen again to a fellow tenant. So as a result, uh, they say the attack could happen again to a fellow tenant. So as a result, the landlord would have a duty to warn all of his tenants every time of all of the criminal history of, of uh, everybody else. Uh, what's more, Megan's laws, for all of their flaws or merits, at least were discussed by legislatures. And there was a sort of, it was on the radar screen. This, you know, this is happening. This is happening in courts without, without much fanfare, without much attention. But this, the, the, the doctrine is emerging that, in fact, you have this duty to disclose information about people. Not a single word in the cardinal opinion about any of the privacy implications. What's more, there's another case which led to no liability, but for technical reasons which wouldn't quite apply uh, to all situations. This isn't limited to situations where, where, where we're talking about information about somebody who is a danger because of his crimes. What about somebody who's a danger because somebody's going after them? Somebody's the target of a stalker or an abusive ex-husband, or you're a hotel and Salman Rushdie's showing up. He wants to be incognito, but maybe you have a duty under this doctrine to warn people, stay away from my hotel. Salman Rushdie is here. He is the target of an attacker. This, is a case, this came up in a case in California where, in fact, a woman was letting her niece stay at her house, uh, uh, and the, the niece was escaping a, uh, an abusive ex. Uh, and the, uh, uh, and uh, um, then what happened was the abusive ex showed up and killed uh, various people in the house, including a gardener, this woman's gardener, who just stopped into the house to get a drink of water. Uh, the gardener's widow sued. Turns out the court there said, in, under these facts, the uh, injury was not foreseeable. But if the facts were a little different, in principle, you could have had a case, uh, which would have required people to disclose information about, about people who are the allowing on the property who are a danger, not because of what they might do, but because of what might be done to them. It's quite commonplace to have lawsuits in which the claim is, I was attacked in your mall parking lot. You could have helped avoid this through various uh, precautions, including surveillance cameras. So again, there's this pressure to have more surveillance. Um, and if, as space recognition software becomes cheaper, the, the claims will be, you didn't set up a software that did face recognition, that checked things against publicly available databases, that alerted you every time a criminal showed up. Perfectly plausible under existing law. Uh, there's a case, Doe v. XYC Corporation, <coughs> excuse me, in which somebody working for XYC, this is New Jersey, about case, somebody working for XYC used the work computer to post nude pictures of his 10-year-old stepdaughter to the internet. This was discovered, obviously, the wife, the wife left him and then sued XYC for not properly monitoring this chattel that it had turned over to him, which is to say the computer. They had these logs. They saw that he visited some porn sites, apparently. But they figured, like many employers do, what's the big deal, at least until one of the uh, co-workers complains? We're not going to go out there, whether it's because of concern about privacy, about morale, or just about their own time. We're not going to go out there and actually monitor very carefully everything he does in this computer. Well, this suggests that they would have a duty to do so. Uh, and a duty that, as electronic monitoring becomes cheaper and cheaper, becomes more and more likely. The last thing I want to do, and then I'll, and then I'll close, is here's a, this, the only lawsuit on here, other than one marked future, that actually hasn't happened yet. But I'm just waiting for it to happen. Imagine that somebody is hit by someone driving a car 80 miles an hour under the influence of alcohol. And he sues the car manufacturer saying, you didn't put in an in engine interlock that would have kept 
the car from being driven by somebody unless they, uh, th their breath was breathalyzed and found to be, to be not, uh, uh, not have uh, much alcohol. What's more, while we're not saying you shouldn't make cars that go 80 miles an hour, we acknowledge sometimes it's legitimate to do that, you should have made your car in a way that when it goes faster than what you deduce to be the speed limit, it sends an email to the local police department alerting them to what's going on. You laugh, and again, this is not a case that's been brought yet, and maybe one thing that would lead to resistance here is maybe a typical jury would say, no, jurors would say, no, we value our ability to speed so long as we don't get caught enough that we won't see if it's a, that's a requirement. But as a matter of formal modern product liability law, which is basically with respect to negligence laws applied to design, uh, this, is, uh, this is a perfectly plausible thing. So what are the questions? I think it makes sense to say, well, under the learned hand formula, what's reasonable enough should weigh privacy costs against safety benefits. And there, are, there are mechanisms to do that with an existing tort law, just courts are going to be fine. The interesting question is how? And also, who should be the judge or the jury? Should you say, let's leave it to the jury to decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether something is required or whether it would be not required because of privacy concerns? Should it be the judge or the legislature? Should it be something we leave to the legislative process, either because legislatures are more legitimate uh, sources for doing this, uh, for making these kinds of value judgments, or maybe because they're more independent? Maybe because they can at least set up rules that have some crisp, bright lines that will be uh, really clear enough to protect privacy uh, uh, in a way that judges will be unable to. So with that, I close. And I've written the first half of the paper that explains the problem, but I don't know the solution. And that's okay. why I'd love to hear feedback. So let us let me ask our panelists if they ha want to comment quickly on Eugene's thoughts. I'll start with Jeff, and then we'll turn it over to questions quickly. Let's try to keep it quick. Jeff? Just quickly, I think he encapsulates so dramatically how bad American law is at uh, valuing or protecting the right to be forgotten. It's, it's really the criminal who wants to not be discriminated against by the landlord or even the guy with the bad sexual history who doesn't want to disclose that to the girlfriend is in a sense trying to escape his past. And European law would know how to value the dignitary interests of the criminal against the interests of the employer. We don't because our Privacy torts only prohibit gross, outrageous uh, invasions of privacy that offend the reasonable person, and that's not the case in, in any of these areas. I, I, I gather from Eugene's excellent paper that there are a couple efforts in American law to prohibit certain kinds of employment discrimination on the basis of criminal history, they, but that just reminds us that we're much better at focusing on discrimination as a value and not dignity. And that's why I think the challenge he set up is difficult, because it's not obvious whether it's courts, legislatures, or uh, administrative agencies that American law has a, has a good tradition of, of doing this. Then, Tom, you want to go? Sure. Uh, in theory, negligence law can deal with this problem without much difficulty. In a design defect case, if I say you should have put in an airbag in your car, you can respond. That would have an external cost of causing people to be injured by the airbag. And so you can have other kinds of externalities of the plaintiff's theory of what the design should have been or what the conduct should have been that said, no, your solution, what you wanted me to do, would cause this harm. And so the issue here in existing doctrinal framework is that we're not valuing the privacy enough. Exactly. And the, there's an almost understandable reason for that that's a lot like issues that you see in the exclusionary rule in the Fourth Amendment, and that is these cases come up as individual common law cases and you have bad facts. So what happens is that if I had the surveillance out there in the shopping mall parking lot every day for three straight years, and people lost their privacy as a consequence of that, none of those people are there when the lawsuit comes along that said you could have had the cameras. And so the court is, is much less conscious of the effect on the absent third parties. Uh, and so you have, to, you have to have a much more robust sense of Hey, and the exclusionary rule example is that, look, you really undervalue the Fourth Amendment if every time the court is seeing it, it's like, oh yeah, but if we protect that privacy, all we're doing is protecting all the people with the crack cocaine, right? So that the Fourth Amendment is it comes up in, not in civil litigation for intruding on your home, but instead in criminal cases on the bad facts, it makes you want to narrow, this is a critique of the exclusionary rule by Akhil Amar and other people, is that you, it makes you narrow the Fourth Amendment. And one of the things you end up doing when it comes up in a negligence case is you end up narrowing privacy, because then you have a case where the, the principle of the case is protecting privacy is bad because somebody got HIV. 
Uh, and so that is a real reason to try and solve these things legislatively because the legislature is going to hear from more and care more about the people whose privacy would be intruded on the other days of the three years. Yeah. It sure seems that when you have an abstract harm, and a, excuse me, an abstract right and a concrete harm, the concrete harm prevails pretty much every time. Uh, should we open it up for questions? Ryan, did you? Yeah, I mean, I, I was going to say something very similar to Thomas, but I was just going to say that there obviously are instances, I mean, these are all evidentiary problems. Like, you're using the lack of privacy intrusion as evidence that I didn't take enough care, right? And we already have public policy exceptions for evidentiary rules and court. So for instance, in many jurisdictions, and probably most jurisdictions, you can't use evidence of the fact that I sit there uh, as an admission that it was dangerous. So why wouldn't you be able to say similarly here, you can't use evidence, and this is just built on time. Why, why can't you use evidence of the fact that um, evidence of the fact that there wasn't surveillance because of some other third I don't think it's quite an evidence question. If the question is, did you fail to take reasonable precautions, this is a claim that this was a reasonable precaution that you failed to take. Not that, the, you're, that you're not surveilling is somehow evidence of your mental state or whatever else. It's just you should have surveilled. It's kind of like with, with a car. There are these cases that say you failed to put in proper, proper bracing in the car to make it crashworthy. You could frame it as it's just evidence of its lack of crash rhythms. What it really is is that that's, that's the, the specific precaution you were asked not to take. Now, there are tort law doctrines, so-called no-duty rules, that say there are certain things you don't have a duty to do. So one classic example in nearly all states is if you serve alcohol at a party and one of your guests goes out there and kills somebody with a scar lighter, you, they are, you can't be held liable because of failure to police your guests or because of just the decision to offer guests in the, bar, the, the stuff or your decision not to cut off the guy when you think that he might be drunk or not to monitor how much he's drinking uh, because we think that's too much of intrusion on <coughs> what I suppose may be seen as a form of privacy, normal social interactions. So I think there, there is room for those. I, just, I think there are no duty tort rules more than evidentiary rules. And the problem is, I mean, I'm all in favor of creating such rules. The question is, is what should be the scope of such rules? The fact is, so far, courts have not created no duty rules aimed at providing privacy, although I think there are good reasons that they should. Well, one, one, one other quick thing I want to say is that um, <coughs> you do seem to bracket the privacy torts yes. um, as, as uh, irrelevant. I think, one, I think one way to think of them as being relevant is that because privacy harm ends up being such an enormous hurdle mm -hmm. Showing privacy um, that tendency of mm -hmm. courts to require actual damages, special damages, specific damages, um, is also going to do some work here in, because it's going to show that they're not going to probably value privacy harm as a counterweight to, to, to do. So, I mean, I would sort of not totally bracket privacy mm -hmm. towards that. Hmm, maybe. Interesting yeah. point. Thank you. Let's take one here. And is, were you, okay, please. So I'm Catherine Crump from the ACLU, and I was one of the privacy advocates who was dancing in the streets after the Jones opinion. And I have to say, even having read Tommy's skeptical blog post, I'm still dancing. Because I think when that case was taken, there was a real fear that the court was simply going to reverse the Manor decision, and we were going to be left with nothing we could rely on to argue that people's movements in public spaces were protected under the Fourth Amendment. So we have but to just reduce your expectations enough. <laughs> <laughs> We're all kind of beleaguered on this. At least we know now, for example, that in what to attach a GPS device to a car, the fourth amendment is indicated even for short term surveillance, I think. And at least we now, um, you know, five of the justices didn't weigh in on the question of whether or not prolonged surveillance, absence of in physical intrusion will violate the fourth amendment. And four of them raised, uh, you know, real, real concerns about that. But I actually wanted to ask a question. I was, would be really curious to hear the other panelists respond to what I actually think is the scarier prospect, which is the point that Jeff raised, right? In, you know, what do we do when every uh, surveillance camera is being beamed onto the internet and all of this footage is available? At that point, what is the remaining value in restricting, for instance, the government's ability to access that information? And if we do think there's value there, what possible doctrinal hook do we have available to us? Well, and that doesn't even get to the drones, right? For those of you last night, right? The surveillance cameras are, are nothing compared to the mowing that we're gonna get with the drones, right? So, uh, so it's worse. 
Uh, the only thing I would say is that in terms of existing Fourth Amendment doctrine, even the folks who seemed more pro-privacy in Jones, Justice Alito's opinion starts this discussion with, hey, the more there is technology, the more people probably have a lessened expectation of privacy. Mm -hmm. And just the folks who are more pro-privacy on the Supreme Court start from that kind of notion of how we're going to look at things. And so I would say the exi whatever exists in the Fourth Amendment now is not going to solve this problem. And I will say, you don't see it in a ton of Supreme Court opinions. You do see it in the Jones-Alito opinion. But the number of times in oral argument, there is the sentiment among the justices, like why I would really love it if the legislature would fix this problem. Of course, Alice Sorrell maybe will strike it down under the First Amendment, but uh, you know that if they, if they could tackle these line drawing problems, life would be uh, a lot easier. Well, would they be able to, for example, place limits on surveillance cameras and what's made available from their feeds uh, under the First Amendment? Could, so the, the hypothetical is there is somebody has a camera and it's pointed towards the public and you're out in public and somebody wants to aggregate all of those feeds, would that violate the First Amendment right of the aggregator? Uh, probably that would be unconstitutional. Especially if Catherine wins in Glick, right? Well, you know, I, I agree that when it comes to private people, could you, could you, the government of course doesn't have the First Amendment rights, right? So could yeah. you do something targeting the government The doctrinal basis you said is moving because as you get all the cameras on the beaches, our expectations go down. No, there's no question about it. The sense of the Supreme Court is that these, these things reflect back on each other. When the Supreme Court says that there's no Fourth Amendment right of pri expectation of privacy, then that affects your tort privacy rights as well, your ability to sue private people. And the reverse is true uh, in turn, and that is that if you're out in a public space and you know that there are cameras on you, the Supreme Court, I think, presently would say that you don't have an expectation against governmental surveillance and that it's going to have to be the government restricting itself and we elect the government. Uh, we're going to have to get laws more than we're going to be able to rely on the Fourth Amendment for that answer, I think. The, the, the solution was signaled by Justice Harlan in his concurrence in the, in the White case involving the transmission of the conversation from the faithless friend. And he said the question isn't what people subjectively experience, but how much privacy people in a free society are entitled to demand. So that's a normative question that does not uh, contingent on technology. And it ultimately comes back to this question of dignity. So again, the Europeans are not going to have any problem restricting Mark Zuckerberg's open planet live Facebook feed system. You, that, that you could invoke the right to be forgotten or just invoke the European rights of personality that say that you need a certain immunity from surveillance, even in public. But we don't have a vocabulary for that. Maybe, therefore, the best avenue is not to focus on uh, constitutional litigation, but on uh, lobbying uh, Google and Facebook not to do this to begin with. And I think the Google people five years ago recognized that there might be such a public outcry if they did link the cameras that they'd rather not do it to begin with. But our, our, our arguments have to be addressed not to the Supreme Court or to Congress, but really to the ISPs. I will say Justice Sotomayor has signaled that she understands and would, would overrule probably cases like White. But she's the only one. Yeah. Uh, we'll take these two. Just keep it really short, please. Thank you. So um, you noted the difficulty with uh, defining what I guess we could sort of over broadly and idealistically define as the right to not have information about you disclosed to other people uh, as property right. And so I'm wondering if the panelists have any theories on a more appropriate basis for that right, whether it be an intellectual property, uh, moral right, publicity right, et cetera. My basis is rejection. Yeah. That if you're talking about a right to stop other people from talking about you, I just don't see why that should be all right. And I agree with Eugene. I mean, he, he was correct in, in saying that thinking about this as property rights and talking about this stuff as property rights is wrong. And I, I, slide, I slid into it, but I think you were right to correct me on that. I, I think that that leads you down to um, some situations that are problematic from a First Amendment um, um, point really quickly. Um, I think that's the puzzle, right? I mean, the puzzle is how do we think about and do we just, how, how do you think about what it is we're trying to protect when we're trying to protect information? And, and I think Jeff's formulation of it is a dignity right kind of sidesteps a lot of the problems that property rights um, would take you down. I'm not sure it gets you all the way there, but, um, but it, I think that's the puzzle right now, is how do you deal with this? A property rights, I don't, I don't think a property rights argument is, 
as easy as it is, because once you say it's a property right, then you know everything else about it. I just don't think it takes you down the right road. And one last question. Yeah. I think because of the technological imperative that you talked about, it really is a question of intrusion. Is there anything that they can't know? And who is they? Well, commercially, you know, it's, it's all driven by advertising. And anything that can be known commercially will be known by the government through the national security letters. So what is it they can't know? And then you, you come back to the old Magna Carta thing, you know, where the king put his foot. And then the question is, well, what about your home information system, right, your personal information system? is protected with via your password. Is, is there a fifth amendment? Was some federal judges have now ruled against that. They say now, given a subpoena, you have to turn over your password. And so then there is absolute penetration, right? So what is the legal status of uh, your protection of, against self-incrimination? Do you have to give up a password or not? Well, the, you're, you're wrong about the subpoena. I mean, that's the, the, the ruling, at least the one that, the ones that we've, we've followed closely, the cases about whether you have to turn over the password. And the issue involved a, a, not, not a mere subpoena, but a, but, a, but a warrant, a court order. Yeah, court order. Do you have to turn over your password for a court order? Well, it's an open question. I mean, I think there's a couple of cases that have looked at it. I don't think we have a definitive answer. Certainly, the Supreme Court's never looked at it. I think the Colorado case was pretty poorly reasoned and poorly decided, and it's going to be looked at on appeal. There's nothing. It's making its way. There's a couple of other cases that we know about that we're following. I don't think it's an answered question now. The well, Fifth Amendment. The Supreme Court rule. Anybody have? Well, uh, yeah, I always ask. <laughs> no. So uh, I, I think there are two different issues here. One is privilege against. We may only have time for one of them. Go. Okay. But the other one <laughs> is the question of privacy. Uh, if you're really concerned about privacy, privilege against self-incrimination won't get you there because Imagine the government is giving you immunity. <coughs> that strips you away from the privilege. Yep. Well, I'll tell you what the government could do. Throughout all of American history, the government could subpoena you and order you to say, to, to say what you said to your friends, to what you said to your family, except your spouse, what your family said to you. This is just part of the basic traditional American principle. You may fault it, but that you don't need a warrant, you don't need a probable cause for a subpoena, that, that every person has a duty to testify honestly, subject to the privilege against self incrimination, which can be erased if there is immunity, about this vast range of things. Anything they've ever done, so long as it's relevant to government investigation, anything that anybody has ever confided in them. Now, you may say that's wrong, but then, but really, you are fighting against the duty to testify, which is very firmly entrenched. It's not some invention of the Ashcroft Gonzalez Justice Department. This is, uh, uh, so, so I think we have to ask. Maybe we sh there should be some broader testimonial immunities, but absent that, the government has a right to know a lot under the duty to Justify. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, let me quickly thank Jeff, Eugene, Tom, Cindy. Thank you very much, everyone.